Hello and welcome to another in my introduction to business series. In this lesson we'll be looking at our human resource management function and attracting and retaining our best employees for our organization. So our discussion is organized around the three major phases of human resource management. That being the acquisition, maintenance, and development of human resources within an organization. And before we look at these three phases, we're going to also note that roles of managers and staff specialists in HRM or human resource management. We're also going to look at the cultural and workplace diversity in human resource management. Like I said, then we're going to look very closely at the three phases of human resource management that I mentioned. The acquisition of personnel begins with human resource planning, which is based on the forecast of our personnel supply and demand on systematic job analysis. So we have to make sure we have the job analysis completed before we just go grab people for roles we don't know what the specific tasks are for those roles. Then we'll talk about recruitment, selection, and orientation and how they complete that phase. Next I'll move on to talk about the issues of employee compensation and benefits in an organization including a number of pertinent definitions that are just common business terms that you should be familiar with. Then we'll look at the final phase and I'll distinguish between employee training and management development and then look at several methods for evaluating employee performances in an organization which is nothing that anyone loves to do um, but we have to do it you know whether we're doing it on a quarterly or yearly basis whatever your organization deems but it's something we need to do and we should do it just can be uncomfortable for some and then I'll look at some of the uh, regulation or legislation on today's human resource management practices so let's go ahead and dive in now and we'll take a look at the first phase or actually element that is knowing exactly what is human resource management and with human resource management this is going to consist of all of the activities that are involved in acquiring maintaining and developing your organization's human resources in other lectures I've talked about the resources that every organization should have and the human aspect or the labor aspect is the most important resource for any organization each of the three phases of human resource management are going to consist of related actions and remember those three phases once again are going to be acquiring maintaining and development of all of our human resources let's talk a little bit about acquisition acquisition includes planning and the various activities that lead to hiring new personnel within your organization altogether this planning phase of human resource management includes five separate activities. Acquisition is going to include first of all the human resource planning. Now this human resource planning this is the determining of our firm's future human resource needs. We don't need to just think about now we need to think about in the future what all are we going to need to fill the roles that we need for our human resource labor force. Then we have job analysis this is where we're determining the exact nature of the positions that need to be filled in our organization. The next activity is going to be recruiting. This is how we're attracting people to apply for those positions that exist within our organization. Now that we've recruited, we need to look at selection. This is choosing and hiring the most qualified applicants for those jobs. For the, that we've completed the job analysis for and we've recruited for. And then once we've selected, we need to provide an orientation or you might even hear this called onboarding. This is acquainting our new employees with our organizations, getting them acclimated into the organization, its culture, its policies and protocols that are in place. Maintaining human resources consists primarily of encouraging our current employees to remain with our organization and to work effectively by using a variety of different human resource management programs that include such things as our employee relations, with increasing our job satisfaction of our employees, 
We need to look at compensation. So we're rewarding our employees' efforts through different monetary payments. And then the third piece we should look at here and have in our organization as part of our HRM programs is the benefits. These are providing rewards to ensure that our employees' well-being. If you maintain these three programs, it's going to help with your attrition and keeping your workforce as part of your workforce. And when you have less attrition, that's less money that's going out to cover positions that need filled with overtime and the, the sheer cost of recruitment of new employees and then the training and development of those employees. Since I mentioned training and development, the development phase of human resource management is going to be concerned with improving our employees' skills and expanding their capabilities, including such things as you know, the, the training and development and then teaching our employees new skills and new jobs and more effective ways of performing their present jobs. And then, as you see here, performance appraisal. Assessing employees' current and potential performance levels. These two elements as part of our development phase are crucial. We want to take our employees that currently exist and are familiar with our organization and make sure that we continue to develop them. And then, what about the performance appraisals of uh, those employees? We need to make sure that we are assessing the current and performance levels of their potential. In general, human resource management is a shared responsibility of line managers and staff human resource management specialists. In very small organizations, the owners handle all or most of the human resource management activities. Now, as a firm grows, a human resource manager is generally hired to take over some of the staff responsibilities and do such things as delegation and try to look at the objectives of the organization and be more of a leader. Human resource planning and job analysis are usually carried out by those HR staff specialists with input from the line managers, those first level managers. Staff experts handle recruiting and selection although the line managers are going to be involved in the actual hiring decisions. Our HR staff specialists devise orientation programs that are going to be carried out by both the same specialists as well as line managers for our new employees. And then with our compensation systems, this usually is going to include benefits and most of these compensation systems are developed and administered by the human resource management staff. Line managers can recommend pay increases and promotion to contribute to that, but the majority of the work is going to be held by the human resource management staff. And trained development activities are the joint responsibility of both our HR staff and the line managers. And the performance appraisal is a job of that first level manager, although your HR personnel often design the overall appraisal system that's going to be used by those first line managers. Now let's talk about the human resource planning. With human resource planning, it's key to know what that is, and that's the development of strategies to meet the firm's future human resource needs and levels of our organization. And this has a lot to do with our core strategies. And I've talked about in previous lessons about how the upper level management creates the goals and the objectives, and then as that trickles down, we have different levels that need to perform those tasks to meet the goals of the objectives. And we can see that directly here in where we're looking at meeting the firm's human resource needs, not only current, but in the future. Planners should base human resource demands on all relevant information available. The firm's overall strategic plan will provide information about future business ventures, new products, and project expansions or contractions of particular product lines. Information on past staffing levels, evolving technologies, industry staffing practices, and projected economic trends can also be very helpful with this human resource planning. Human resource management managers are going to use forecasting information 
to determine both the numbers of employees required as well as their qualifications. Now when it comes to forecasting our human resources supply, a forecast of human resources supply must take into account both the present workforce and any changes or movements that may occur within it. There are two useful techniques for forecasting our human resource supply um, and that is with a replacement chart and a skills inventory. A replacement chart is going to be a list of key personnel along with possible replacements that exist within the firm. And a skills inventory is just like it sounds, it's going to be a searchable database containing information on the skills and expertise of all of the present employees. These are two very critical tools that should be available to you for forecasting your human, your human resource supply within your organization. And then you should be able to match your supply with the demand. So once you've forecasted the supply and demand for your personnel, our HR planners can devise a course of action for matching one with one another. When demand is predicted to be greater than the supply, they must make plans to recruit new employees. The timing of recruitment effort depends on the types of positions that need to be filled within your organization. When the supply of employees is predicted to be greater than the demand, the firm must take steps to reduce the size of its workforce. This isn't a great task to have, but we need to do what's best for the business. When the oversupply is expected to be temporary, some employees may be what's known as being laid off. This is where they're temporarily dismissed from the workforce until they are needed again. Perhaps the most humane method for making personnel cutbacks is through attrition, the normal reduction in the workforce that occurs when employees simply leave your organization. Early retirement is yet another option, and under early retirement, employees who are within a few years of retirement are permitted to retire ahead of schedule with the full benefits that they would have received if they had been there until their actual retirement date. Buyouts happen and they are similar to early retirement in that employees are offered a severance package to leave their job. We're going to give you X amount of money and, and comp different compensation for you to leave now. And as a last resort, unnecessary employees are sometimes just simply let go or fired from the organization. You might hear this term being used that are your rings of defense within your organization. Now let's move on to talk about uh, our cultural diversity in human resources. A large number of women, minorities, and immigrants have entered the U.S. workforce in you know, recent decades. And it's estimated that women make up about 47% of our overall U.S. workforce. African Americans and Hispanics can make up about 12 and 17% of our U.S. workers, respectively. Cultural diversity, or you may hear this known as workforce diversity, refers to the difference among people, a workforce, based off of their race, their ethnicity, and even their gender. Increasing in cultural diversity is having managers to learn to supervise and motivate people who have a very broad range of value systems based off of those different categories. Now, although cultural diversity presents a challenge, managers should be viewing it as an opportunity rather than a limitation for their growing. When properly managed, cultural diversity can result in a stronger organization. There are several competitive advantages that creative management of cultural diversity can offer an organization. Because cultural diversity produces both challenges and advantages, it's important for an organization's employees to understand it. To accomplish this goal, numerous U.S. firms have trained their managers to respect and manage diversity. Diversity training programs may include recruiting minorities, training minorities to be managers, training managers to view diversity positively, teaching English as a second language, and facilitating support groups for immigrants. An example of where you could experience diversity is with Latin Americans in your organization. They tend to stand closer in proximity to people with whom they're talking rather than the typical North Americans prefer. But we should 
grasp this, embrace it, and learn from it, and have that very diverse workforce and take advantage of all of the different advantages that can come with this cultural diversity. You should take it on and reap the rewards instead of trying to be negative. Now let's take a look at job analysis. And I mentioned this earlier, a job analysis is a systematic procedure for studying positions to determine their various elements and requirements. The job analysis for a particular position typically consists of two parts. You're going to have the job description and a job specification. A job description is just like it sounds. It's a list of the elements that make up that particular job and keep, makes it different than another job. A job specification is a list of the qualifications required to perform that particular job, such as certain skills, abilities, education, and experience that are required to perform that job. In an organization with jobs that are waiting to be filled, human resource management personnel need to find the candidates and to match the right candidate with each available position. So this is where we talk about recruiting. And recruiting is the process of attracting qualified job applicants. One of our goals of recruiting is to, to track the right number of applicants, which is enough to allow a good match between the applicants and those open positions, but not so many, a lot of extra work for our human resource management personnel. So be careful with that. Get a good number of potential applicants, but not an excessive amount. And this recruiting can be a lot of time and effort and your recruiters may seek applicants outside the firm within the firm or a mix of both external recruiting is the attempt to attract job applicants from outside the organization and this external recruiting may include activities on such places as college campuses or providing open houses at the organization soliciting, re soliciting recommendations from your current employees or posting in publications like newspapers, online employment agencies, or local employment agencies. Clearly, it is best to match the recruiting means with the kind of applicants that are being sought. Technology is definitely helping us in this matching process. A primary advantage of using this external recruiting is that it brings people into a firm who have a new perspective and varied business backgrounds. A disadvantage of this external recruiting is that it's often expensive and it may also provoke some resentment among current employees who are there and they, they've been there, they've put their time in, and they wish to advance within the company and they may not see that they're not getting that uh, opportunity. Now the other aspect of using internal recruiting, this involves considering present employees as applicants for those available positions. Generally, current employees are considered for promotion to higher level positions, and they may also be considered for transfer from one position to another within that same level. Promoting from within provides strong motivation for our current employees and helps our organization retain quality personnel and not losing them because of not having adequate opportunities for them in our organization. The practice of job posting or informing our current employees of upcoming openings may be a company policy or a union contract requirement wherever you're at. The primary disadvantage of internal recruiting is that promoting a current employee leaves another position open. Now let's talk about the selection part. Now selection is the process of gathering information about applicants for a position and then using that information to choose the most appropriate applicant. An employment application is useful for collecting factual information on a candidate's education, their work experiences, and their, their history. The data from application is going to be used to identify candidates who are worthy of further scrutiny and to familiarize interviewers with the applicant's backgrounds for the interview process. Many job candidates submit resumes to prospective employers and some firms require them. A resume is a one and sometimes a two page summary of the candidate's background and qualifications. 
typically the one page is a good one to have because you're not spending a lot of time looking through it. You're seeing all the information you need right away. Then there are the employment tests. These are tests that are administered to job candidates, usually focusing on aptitude, skills, and abilities, or knowledge that's relevant to the jobs that are open and need to be performed. Companies may use general intelligence or personality tests, but they are seldom useful in predicting a new person's performance. Many organizations are going to use predictive behavior tests, which have become more affordable with our improved technology. The interviews. The interviews are going to perhaps be the most widely used selection technique because it's going to provide an opportunity for the applicants and people within the organization to learn more about each other. Job candidates are usually interviewed by at least one member of the human resource management staff and by a person from whom they will be working. Interviewers may pose problems to test the candidates abilities, probe their employment history, and learn something about the candidates attitudes and motivation. You just have to be aware of what the human resource laws are so that you don't break any laws when you're interviewing a potential candidate. There should be some type of training that is provided to the potential interviewers so that they know what they can and cannot ask and talk about. We want to talk about references next. And, and a reference, now this is a job candidate, is generally going to be asked to furnish the potential employer with names or references of people who can verify their background information and provide some type of personal evaluations. A lot of companies are using third parties for doing this because of the cost and the time that it takes to run these references. An assessment center is going to be used primarily to select current employees for promotion to those higher level positions I was talking about. Typically a group of employees is sent to this center for a few days. While there they participate in these various activities that are going to be designed to simulate the management environment to these potential employees for that are looking at these higher level positions and trained observers are going to make their recommendations regarding promotion possibilities for them. So as you can see there is a lot that goes in to the selection phase here. So it's not just you know a one step thing so hopefully you will go and seek out some more information speak with someone you know that's in the human resources department maybe look into some other sites about the human resource management process so that you can become more familiarized with the process and realize that there's a lot that goes into selecting the right candidates for jobs. Once we've selected them, well now it's time to talk about the orientation of those new employees. Once all the available information about job candidates has been collected and analyzed, a job offer is going to be extended. If that new employee accepts that, the candidate is now going to need a process of acquiring new employees within our organization. So we want to, our people in their orientation process to not only know about the protocols of our organization, but to acquaint them with the organization on different levels. One of the things that you should do in an orientation process is to have a structured orientation process and then allow members of your organization to come in and speak with these new employees so that they are acquainted with them and they will recognize faces and what their roles are in your organization. The orientation itself may range widely from a, you know, it could be a very informal presentation that could last a half hour or it could be a very elaborate, well-designed program that involves dozens of people and lasting several days or even weeks. I myself have been and orientations that have lasted several weeks and once you go through a very structured orientation you realize the benefits of that and how more acclimated into the organization you will feel as opposed to you know a really quick half hour here are the very minimum basics now get to work type situation. Well, now we'll talk a little bit about compensation and benefits. An effective employee reward system must 
enable employees to satisfy their basic needs. They should provide rewards comparable to those offered by other forms. And your reward system should be distributed fairly within your organization, as well as recognize that different people simply have different needs. The organization's compensation system should be structured to meet the first three of these requirements. Now, the fourth of recognizing that different people have different needs is much more difficult and it must take into account that many differences occur amongst different people. We all have different backgrounds and therefore we have different needs, different situations. So when you become more seasoned, this will become much easier. When it comes to compensation decisions, you know, the compensation is just a payment that employees receive in return for their labor. The firm's compensation system, um, this is all those policies and strategies that determine the employee compensation. This must be designed to provide for employee needs while keeping labor costs within reasonable limits. So we need to talk about wage levels. Management must first position the firm's general pay level that's relative to pay levels of comparable firms. You need to determine what the average is. The firm may use a wage survey where it's sent out to different places within the community so that they know that they are going to be on the average. And this collection of data um, within an industry or a geographical area can be employed very easily. You might even use a third party to do this so it's not um, directly seen that you are the one that's doing this. But you should definitely, especially a new business, should go out there and make sure that you are using a wage survey so that you're attracting people and you're offering a fair wage. Now when it comes to the wage structure, after we've developed this level, we as management must decide on relative pay levels for all the positions within our organization. The result of this set of decisions is called our organization's wage structure. And this wage structure is almost always developed on the basis of a job evaluation, which is the process of determining the relative worth of the various jobs within any organization. A number of techniques can be used in, when we're evaluating these jobs. And the simplest of these is just to rank all the jobs within the firm according to their value to your organization. A more frequently used method is based on a job analysis, and we are going to have different points that are allocated to each element and job requirement. Well, now let's talk about the individual wages. The company must determine the specific payments individual employees are going to receive. Two wage decisions come into play here. First, the employee's initial rate must be established, and it's based on experience, other qualifications, and expected performance. And then later, the employee must be given pay increases based on seniority and performance or a combination of both. And since we're talking about wages, we have to talk about comparable worth. This is just a concept that seeks equal compensation for jobs requiring about the same level of education, training, and skills. In recent decades, many states have taken steps to ensure that all workers have equal pay for comparable worth, but the issue is contentious. A few companies have taken steps to address the situation by publicizing the results of their investigations into their own pay gaps. You can look up examples of this with comparable worth with such companies as Amazon, Apple, Google, Intel, even SpaceX. They've all disclosed the results of reviews of employee pay to highlight their lack of pay gap and what they're doing. There are different types of compensation in an organization. One such type of pay compensation is that of the hourly wage. An hourly wage is a specific amount of money that's paid for each hour that is worked by an employee. People who earn wages are paid their hourly wage for the first 40 hours worked in any given week, and it can be less based on the type of organization, especially if you're like a part-time worker. 
when in a typical environment where you're full time, you're working 40 hours a week, anything in excess of those 40 hours is what's considered overtime for which they are paid usually one and a half times their hourly wage. You might even come across an organization that when it comes to overtime, they do a declining scale or they may do some type of uh, scalable pay um, where even like after 48 hours, um, you go up to double time. It just depends on the organization. Then we have weekly or monthly salaries. A salary is a specific amount of money paid for an employee's work during a set calendar period, regardless of the number of hours they work. Even in education, you could find that there are even larger scales of this salary where a person can be paid not weekly, not monthly, may they get paid quarterly or semi-annually or annually. Just depends on the area that you're working in. Now a commission is another type of payment and this is um, where some percentage of sales revenue is your payment based off of that. Then we have incentive payments. An incentive payment is in addition to wages, salary, or commissions. Incentive payments are simply rewards for outstanding job performance. Some organizations offer incentives to employees who exceed specific sales or even production goals in manufacturing. Um, and this is a practice, you know, they even practice like gain sharing. Some organizations reward outstanding workers individually through some type of merit pay. This pay for performance approach allows management to control its labor costs while encouraging employees to work much more efficiently. Then we have another one that's called the lump sum salary increase. So a lump sum salary increase allows the employee the option of taking the entire pay raise in one lump sum. The employee then draws his or her regular pay for the rest of the year. It takes a lot of discipline for a lump sum salary increase. Another type of compensation um, you might have heard of or may not have is that's profit sharing. Profit sharing is going to be the distribution of a percentage of the firm's profit among its employees. And this is going to be based on several different criteria that are set within the organization. Now let's move on to talk about employee benefits. And an employee benefit is simply a reward in addition to the regular compensation that's provided indirectly to employees. Employee benefits consist mainly of services that are paid for partially or totally by the employers and the employee expenses that are reimbursed by the employer. You might get you know, like college tuition as a benefit to where you're at. So that's not part of your actual salary, but it's a benefit, something added on to that you can or cannot take advantage of. Medical insurance, eye insurance, dental insurance, these are all examples of benefits. I'll talk a little bit more about that with types of benefits um, and our employee benefits based on your organization can take a variety of forms. There could be one that's pay for time that's not worked and this is going to cover such things as your absences or vacations, holidays, sick leave. These are pay for time that's not worked. You're still getting paid even though you're not actually at work. Insurance packages may include such things as health, life, dental insurance for not only you, but also for your families. Retirement is a big one that people always wonder if they're getting as a benefit and not everyone takes advantage of it. The cost of pension and retirement programs may be borne entirely by the firm or it could be shared with the employee. And there's also some benefits that are required by law. Uh, such ones are going to include that your employer must maintain workers compensation insurance which is going to pay for medical bills for injuries that have occurred to you on the job and provide income for employees who are disabled by those job related injuries. Employers must also pay for unemployment insurance and they must contribute to each employee's federal social security account. So as an employer, make sure you realize this. If you are a small business or you become an entrepreneur, you have to think about these things. Now, other benefits um, employers may provide include, as I mentioned, tuition reimbursement plans, 
like be part of a credit union. They could be uh, part of a like a park that the company owns for different get-togethers and allowing you to bring your children to. Uh, maybe a company cafeteria. This is a benefit too, so you don't have to bring your food. Uh, there could also be, you know, stock option plans that are available to you. Make sure that during your orientation process, you learn about all the employee benefits that are available to you. Now, when thinking about developing a training program, managers must first determine if training is actually needed, and if so, what type of training is needed and what exists. Employers may find that sometimes employees need motivation more than they need training. Training and development are usually differentiated as employee training or management development. So with employee training, this is the process of teaching operations and technical employees how to do their present jobs more effectively and efficiently. Management development is going to be a process of preparing managers and other professionals to assume increased responsibility in both their present as well as future positions. Several methods are available for employee training and management development. We have on-the-job methods, and this is where the trainee learns by doing the work under the supervision of a more experienced employee. You may also have simulations available, and this is the work situation is going to be simulated in a separate area so that learning takes place away from the day-to-day -day pressure of the work, but it can bring you up to speed on what you need to perform once you actually get on the job. There's also going to be classroom teaching and lectures where instructors present concepts and illustrations through a variety of different techniques. You may also have conferences and seminars. This is where experts and learners come together to discuss their problems and exchange ideas. Another method that could be employed is that of role playing in which participants are going to act out others roles in the organization in order to better understand them. Uh, this is primarily going to be a management development tool. And then we could also have e-learning. With electronic learning, participants train by watching videos of lectures or how-to guides, playing games even, that simulate work situations, or they could be taking online quizzes to demonstrate their proficiency on the topic that needs to be trained. Performance appraisal is going to be that evaluation of employees' current and potential levels of performance to allow managers to make unbiased human resource decisions. Performance appraisal has three main objectives. First, managers must use performance appraisals to let workers know how well they are doing and how they can improve in the future. Secondly, it should provide an effective basis for distributing rewards such as pay raises and promotions. Third, it helps an organization monitor its employees based off their employee satisfaction, based off their training, and any type of development activities. There are common evaluation techniques and methods for appraising employee performances um, and they're either objective or judgmental in nature. Objective methods are going to use some measurable quantity as the basis for assessing their performance, such as units of output, dollar volumes of sales, um, maybe there was a quality level that had to be reached, such as the number of defective products within a given period of time, so there's lots of different measurable quantities that we can use for objective methods. Such objective measures, measures may require adjustment depending on the work environment and taking into account circumstances that may be hidden by a purely statistical measurement. And with judgment methods, this appraisal methods are used much more frequently than the objective methods. These are going to require that you as the manager judge or estimate the employee's performance level. You can use a rating scale. This is really the most popular judgment appraisal technique is using that rating scale. 
A rating scale consists of a number of statements on which each employee is rated based on the degree to which the statement applies. The ratings on all of the statements are added to obtain the employee's overall total evaluation. When it comes to avoiding appraisal errors, managers must be cautious if they are to avoid making mistakes when appraising employees. It's common to overuse one portion of an evaluation instrument, thus overemphasizing or underemphasizing various issues. A manager must guard against allowing an employee's poor performance on one activity during the period to influence their judgment of that subordinate's work on all other activities during that period of time. Similarly, putting too much weight on a recent performance can distort an employee's evaluation as well. And finally, managers must guard against discrimination on the basis of such things as race, age, gender, religion, sexual orientation, or national origin. No matter which appraisal technique you use, the results should be discussed with the employee soon after it's been completed. The information provided to an employee in such discussions is called performance feedback, and the process is known as a performance feedback interview. There are three major approaches to performance feedback interviews. The first one I'll talk about is in a tell and sell feedback interview. Here the supervisor tells the employee how good or not so good the employee's performance has been and attempts to persuade the employee to accept the evaluation. Because the employee has no input, this type of interview can result in defensiveness, resentment, and frustration on the employee's part. Now, with the tell and sell or the tell and listen approach, the supervisor tells the employee what the employee has done right and wrong and then gives them a chance to respond. A subordinate may simply be given an opportunity to react to the supervisor's statements or may be permitted to offer a full self appraisal. Now, in the problem solving approach, Employees evaluate their own performance and set their own goals for future performances. The supervisor is more a colleague than a judge and offers comments and advice in a non-critical manner. This is a method most likely to result in employee commitment to the established goals. Another approach that's becoming popular is called the 360 degree evaluation and in this one um, this collects an anonymous reviews about an employee from their peers and then compiles them into a feedback report for the employee. And, you know, besides their direct peers, there could be subordinates and supervisors, and then all this information is compiled together and then a feedback report is given to the employee. A lot of managers find it difficult to discuss the negative aspects of an appraisal, lending them to ignore performance feedback. Just know it is important for employees to be informed on how they can improve. Without this feedback, an employee may be unaware of their weaknesses and they will never be addressed. So don't be afraid to discuss negative aspects because you want the best for your employees and employees want to do their best work. And lastly, there are some major federal laws affecting human resource management that you should be aware of and learn more about go beyond my video and do some more research. One of these would be the National Labor Relations Act and Labor Management Relations Act. These laws are concerned with dealings between business firms and labor unions. And the Fair Labor Standards Act, this act applies primarily to your wages. It establishes minimum wages and overtime pay rates Many managers and other professionals, however, are exempt from this law. You will usually find a Fair Labor Standards Act poster usually around almost every organization that's put up on a bulletin board and displayed, or employees have been given copies of that. The Equal Pay Act, um, this law overlaps somewhat with the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, in which this act specifies that men and women who are doing equal jobs must be paid the same wage. 
Equal jobs are ones that demand equivalent effort, skill, and responsibility and are performed under the exact same conditions. Discrepancies in pay are legal if they can be attributed to differences in seniority, qualifications, and performance. Next one that we're looking at here is the Civil Rights Act. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 forbids organizations with 15 or more employees to discriminate in employee selection and retention on the basis of sex, race, color, national origin, or even religion. The purpose of Title VII is to ensure that employers make personnel decisions on the basis of employee qualifications only. A person who believes that he or she has been discriminated against can file a complaint with the EEOC. Next one to talk about is that of the Occupational Safety and Health Act. This act is concerned with issues of employee health and safety. The Occupational Sa Safety and Health Act administration was created to enforce this act. You probably will hear them known as OSHA. Next one we'll talk about here is that of Americans with Disabilities Act. In this act, the this is going to prohibit, prohibit discrimination against qualified individuals with the disabilities in all employment practices, including even the job application procedures, the hiring, firing, advancement, compensation, training, and other terms and conditions of employment. All private employers and government agencies with 15 or more employees are covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. Employers are required to provide disabled employees with reasonable accommodation, which is any modification or adjustment to a job or work environment that will enable a qualified employee with a disability to be able to perform a central job function, such as making existing facilities accessible to and usable by wheelchair-bound individuals. Now, these aren't the only federal acts you should know about. I mean, you should definitely look into Affirmative Action, Employee Retirement Income Safety Acts. You know, there's the, there's so many much more that are out there, but you should be aware of them. Having this information will only be, help you be better informed and make better business decisions. There is a lot, hopefully, that you see based off of my discussion about attracting and retaining the best employees. The human resource management function is very diverse, very detailed, and there's a lot that goes into it in helping get the best people and keep the best people within our organizations. Hope you found this information helpful and that you go out and seek even more information. Keep learning everybody and thank you for following along.